Rising water, flooding and landslides in Sri Lanka has killed almost 200 people and more rain is on the way. Coping with the investigation, the Trump administration is considering new ways to handle the Russia investigation. And Tiger Woods arrested and the golf great could face charges. Thanks for being with me, everyone. I'm Amara Walker and this is CNN Today. everyone this just in North Korean state media announced leader Kim Jong-un is planning to ramp up development of the country's ballistic rockets quote to show the power of our self-defense industry state media are calling the latest missile test a success let's get right to Will Ripley at CNN Tokyo with the very latest developments hi there Will Hey, Amra. Well, we heard North Korea say that they're going to be ramping up their missile development last week when the Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, talked about mass producing the ballistic missile that they tested. Uh, now, this latest test, a Scud missile, analysts believe, uh, landed within the exclusive economic zone. These are the waters close to uh, the Japanese mainland, which prompted a strong response from Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, saying that Japan will take concrete action against North Korea along with the U.S. And and South Korea, South Korea also promising a strong military response. Pretty typical rhetoric uh, when North Korea launches missiles like this. But what exactly they are going to do remains unclear. Uh, we have seen no success in U.S. policy over the last decade since North Korea's first uh, nuclear test. They've now conducted five countless missile launches, sanctions, condemnation, isolation, strategic patience. All of it has not stopped North Korea from continuing to grow its arsenal. And even uh, the latest tweets from President Trump are indicating that the U.S. is going to rely very heavily on China to solve this, even though China has really done little to slow North Korea's uh, weapons program. They continue to trade very heavily with the country. The North Koreans would say China has no influence whatsoever on their weapons program and will not, even if China were to take stronger action. But you can see the complicated situation that uh, the U.S. and its allies find themselves in because really, aside from talking with North Korea, perhaps acknowledging them as a nuclear power or getting China to heavily sanction uh, or cut off the country economically, the only other option would be a military one, which is extremely uh, unpalatable because it would be so catastrophic, uh, particularly for, uh, potentially for South Korea, with so many North Korean conventional weapons aimed directly at Seoul, uh, which is why you hear U.S. officials saying that a military conflict, if it were to break out, would probably be the worst fighting that most people who are alive today ha have ever seen in their lifetimes, with the exception of the few surviving veterans of uh, the Vietnam War, the, the Korean War, and World War II. And, and will the succession of missile tests by North Korea in just such a short period of time is obviously uh, very concerning because as we know with each test it brings North Korea that much closer uh, to having a, a, a ballistic missile that could reach the continental United States. Uh, but we're talking about a third missile test in just three weeks. How does this particular test compare to the ones previously? Well, obviously, each test allows North Korea and its rocket scientists to, to learn more, to get to gain intelligence that helps them with their next launch. And, and remember, there were several uh, failed missile launch attempts just last month. I was in the country when they attempted to launch two missiles. Both of those attempts were failures. Now we've seen three successful tests in a row. The, the most noteworthy, which is the one three weeks ago, the one that landed close to Vladivostok, Russia, because that missile actually went high enough that it left the Earth's atmosphere, and then there was a, a successful re entry that uh, we're talking about potential for an ICBM and that's what actually has prompted the United States to conduct this this test of its upgraded interceptor system which is going to be happening in the coming hours this is going to be really critical because the US needs to show that this upgraded system could effectively shoot down a North Korean ICBM type missile and it's very unclear right now whether they actually have that capability reliably given the fact that out of uh, previous tests of the system trying to shoot down non-ICBMs, which analysts say are easier to shoot down, they've only had a, a success rate of about 50%. Uh, that means that 50% of the time the missile would hit its designated target, and it only takes one missile and one nuclear warhead uh, 
to create a real disaster. So this is an urgent, an urgent issue with no easy answers right now. Yeah, and knowing that successors or a failure rate of these interceptor tests, I'm sure people in California and Alaska aren't. Uh, uh, it's not sitting well with them. But of course, all eyes on this interceptor test by the Pentagon. Will Ripley, live for us there in Tokyo. Thank you very much. Uh, meantime, CNN political and national security analyst David Sanger says the North's latest tests involve a technology that would give the U.S. little warning of an attack. My colleague Michael Holmes and I asked him about that earlier in the program. Most of the missile tests that you've seen North Korea uh, do over the years have been liquid fuel uh, missiles, including that SCUD that you saw yesterday. They're not of huge concern, the short-range SCUDs. Uh, the big concern here in the United States, of course, is whenever North Korea develops an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile, that could reach the United States. They're not quite there yet. What's interesting in the past year is that they have begun launching solid fuel rockets. Now, it sounds like that's just a different way of making the fuel. But in fact, liquid fuel rockets are fairly easy to spot. You've got to roll them out to some place. You've got to fuel them. That process takes a few hours. That gives you time to get your missile defenses ready and gives you time to decide whether to try to attack the rocket on the launch pad. Now, a solid fuel rocket, on the other hand, is sort of factory made with its fuel in it. They can keep it in a cave, roll it out, and just as you were showing there on the screen, they can then mount it on one of those trucks and launch it. You have only minutes. Mm. So that reduces the available time, and that's significant for the American missile defenses, which have not been tested in three years, mm. but are supposed to undergo their next test tomorrow. Yeah, now now, you also write about that U.S. system that is meant to intercept a missile such as that theoretical one. And, and you write that it is, uh, it, it, it's fraught with flaws and, uh, and risk. Well, the United States has been trying to design missile defenses since the Eisenhower administration. During that time, we've spent a little more than $300 billion on them. The systems that are based in Alaska and California, those are the two that are... Uh, uh, aimed at intercepting a North Korean missile, have gone through uh, nine tests over the past 13 years. Four of them have worked if you are generous in your definition of worked. Mm. The one tomorrow will be the 10th in 13 years, uh, and it will be the first one against a missile that is moving at the speed at which an ICBM would be coming into the United States. So there's a lot riding on that test. Sri Lanka is in desperate need of international aid as it grapples with its worst flooding in more than a decade. At least 177 people have been killed in flooding and landslides triggered by record monsoon rains. And that number is expected to rise. On top of that, people are being warned they could be attacked by crocodiles lurking in the waters. Rescuers are struggling to reach thousands who are stranded in remote areas. Our Ravi Agarwal has more. A rope descends from the skies. Much needed aid, gratefully accepted. This is the reason why towns and villages submerged in Sri Lanka's worst floods since 2003. Here are some of the displaced, more than 100,000 people across the country, as torrential rains pounded the tiny island nation through the weekend. They are escaping situations like this, houses almost disappearing in the rising floodwaters. A few rescue attempts are made. But homes are left behind, with precious belongings lost forever. And it's not just floods. The heavy rains following a severe drought also triggering deadly landslides, with workers looking for survivors. Sri Lanka has deployed 2,000 military personnel and it's set up evacuation centers in the worst affected areas in Ratnapura, just 60 miles southeast of the capital, Colombo, providing food and shelter to the displaced. It is not enough. The country's foreign minister admitted to, quote, a problem of limited resources and asked for help. Neighboring India heeded that call over the weekend. Three ships were deployed with relief personnel and supplies. As the death toll rises and the water remains high, the race is on to get help to those who need it most. Ravi Agrawal, CNN, New Delhi.
And Tom Sater is here with more on this situation, uh, this weather situation in the region. The pictures really tell the story just, just awful, the, the threats that they're facing, including crocodiles yeah, in the water. If it's not bad enough, you're in survival mode, just yes. looking for fresh water. But there is a call for international aid, and it's being answered. And hats off to India, who's now sent their third vessel there, Pakistan, uh, China. Russia uh, mm -hmm. making the call as well. But it's been a relatively quiet 2017 uh, weather-wise across the globe. This is going to be close to the scale of the flooding in Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh, the death toll is at 314 uh, in Colombia. Peru is 94, even though 177 now, it continues to go up. And if you take a look at the pictures, one of the reasons was the landslides. Uh, what you do not know is that usually when the death toll rises, the number of missing goes down. But that hasn't been the case here. The number of missing is going up. It's now at 112. Uh, communities are inundated. In some cases, we have uh, water that's up to 10 meters high. Uh, again, the fear is that these three main rivers that are rising high uh, will not recede quickly because this is the first rain event of the monsoon season. And yes, there is a fear of some crocodiles uh, attacks, but again, it's the survival mode they're in right now. They need the clean water. The UN is involved. Uh, we We've got the World Food Program that's helping out. We're going to talk about our cyclone in a minute. That's another issue. But they've had a rain-free evening, and that's a good over 24 hours. But as mentioned, as the aid arrives here, first responders have had problems as well. Sri Lankan a helicopter had to make an emergency landing in floodwaters. That wasn't planned. Another Air Force official fell to his death out of a helicopter during a, a high rescue mission. Here's the curtain, current position of the monsoon. It hasn't officially begun uh, in India, but it's right over our flood issue to the south and western part of, of Sri, uh, Sri Lanka. Again, these pictures south of Colombo. Rain is in the forecast, and more rain is in the forecast, not just for parts of Sri Lanka, but in southwest India. And now it's Bangladesh. 300,000 have been evacuated along that 700-kilometer uh, coastline of Bangladesh as we look at our tropical cyclone Mora move in. Moving in at about uh, one to three hours, it'll stay at tropical storm strength just under hurricane or typhoon strength. But we've got Chinagong here. It's the home of four million people, a big coastal port. Dhaka should see heavy rain from that area eastward, one of the largest largest cities in the world, Amra. So we're going to need international aid here as well. A major, uh, we know that even tropical depressions cause problems. So this is one to watch and uh, landfall just a couple hours away. Yeah, it uh, looks like a lot of problems brewing. Tom Sater, thank you. The Philippine military claims it is on the verge of retaking a city besieged by militants linked to ISIS, and that is according to CNN Philippines. Marawi, on the southern island of Mindanao, has been under martial law for a week. The government says the fighting has killed more than 60 terrorists, 18 troops, and nearly 20 civilians. There was a need to do surgical airstrikes because of strategically emplaced enemy presence. So we cannot do otherwise because if we do not employ uh, combat power as we needed it and saw it fit, we would prolong uh, the clearing process and we would uh, endanger more lives, both civilian and military. The Brigadier General also went on to say the military is still trying to weed out pockets of resistance. Golfing legend Tiger Woods was in a Florida jail for several hours early Monday in police custody. Woods was arrested in the city of Jupiter at about 3 a.m. on suspicion of driving under the influence. He was released a few hours later. Now, Woods has not won a major tournament since 2008, and he has struggled physically with multiple back surgeries uh, in the past three years, just four of those in the past three years. Up next here on CNN Today, Donald Trump defends his senior advisor amid fresh controversy involving Russia. The details in a report from Washington. Plus, this. We'll have more ahead. I lost their lives because of me and my friend and the way we were. An emotional teenager thinking the two men who died and the one who survived while defending her on an Oregon train. We'll have more of that interview just ahead. Indonesia, a culture in transition. Meet the people, trying to keep traditions. We need to educate the people, the children, because the battery is our culture. While creating a new modern identity, 
Our mission is to draw global attention to the cuisine. The Keepers, Wednesday on CNN. We're getting new details of how the terrorists operated. From this town is completely blanketed in ash. It's hard to breathe. This can't really be happening. This shot tells the story. Pope Francis will make his way to this path. The live shot is ready. Stand by in three, two. What did you uncover following developments in Nigeria? What was just announced? Let's just talk about this ISIS attack. Hi, Robin. 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 That's right, Robin. Hello? No one asks us to go. Into the chaos. Hello. Into the heartbreak. Welcome. It's the story that drives us forward. It's the story that needs to be told. This is why we go. Let's go live to CNN senior international correspondent Nimal Bagh. Just into CNN, a powerful car bomb has killed at least nine people in the Iraqi capital, Baghdad. Officials say two dozen other people were wounded. Uh, this video captured the moment of the explosion. Just take a look. Uh, police say the bomb, there you go, went off shortly after midnight in the busy al Huria Square in central Baghdad. ISIS is claiming responsibility, and the terror group says it was targeting a gathering of Shiites, just a very large blast there that uh, has uh, two dozen people wounded and nine people dead. From the conflict in Syria to alleged campaign hacking, French President Emmanuel Macron covered a range of issues in his first meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin since taking office. The two sat down at the palace in Versailles outside Paris, where Mr. Macron stressed to Mr. Putin that France's top priority is to combat terrorism. When asked about the alleged hacking of the Macron campaign, Mr. Putin denied that Russia was involved, saying the claim was not based on facts. In Washington, U.S. President Donald Trump honored America's fallen service members on Memorial Day during a visit to Arlington National Cemetery. But the controversy still swirls at the White House as Mr. Trump looks to quell questions after new revelations involving Russia. Our Jeff Zeleny has more. Present. President Trump paying respects oh. today at Arlington National Cemetery. On his first Memorial Day as Commander-in-Chief, the President honoring heroes from wars gone by. We pay tribute to those brave souls who raced into gunfire, roared into battle, and ran into hell to face down evil. And hailing those fighting in conflicts still being waged today. Today, a new generation of American patriots are fighting to win the battle against terrorism. With the sound of taps echoing across the sacred grounds of Arlington, the president and his top military commanders looking on, a poignant reminder of a decision he's facing, whether to accept their recommendation to send more troops to Afghanistan. The president making an impromptu stop at Section 60, the final resting place for Americans killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. He visited the grave of Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly's son, killed seven years ago in Afghanistan's Helmand province. The Afghanistan decision and a growing list of items on the president's agenda have been overshadowed and in some cases complicated by the internal chaos at the White House. Jared Kushner, the president's senior advisor and son-in-law, is under fire for trying to establish a secret channel of communications with Russian officials during the transition. He's willing to discuss the matter with the FBI and Congress, officials tell CNN, but the scrutiny is threatening to upend his first among equal status in the West Wing. Trying to move beyond the crisis, the president is still weighing a reshuffling of his staff, although aides tell CNN 
nothing is imminent. The president making clear his annoyance in a storm of weekend tweets. It is my opinion that many of the leaks coming out of the White House are fabricated lies made up by the fake news media. He added this. The fake news media works hard at disparaging and demeaning my use of social media because they don't want America to hear the real story. After returning from his first international trip, the White House hoped the president's time abroad would change the subject. I think we hit a home run no matter where we are. But tonight, his meetings with world leaders also being seen in a harsher light, with German Chancellor Angela Merkel bluntly saying the U.S. is no longer a reliable partner. The times when we could completely count on others, they're over to a certain extent. I've experienced this in the last few days, and that is why I can only say that we Europeans must really take our fate into our own hands. CNN senior White House correspondent Jeff Zeleny reporting there. Now, uh, we spoke last hour with former undercover KGB agent Jack Barsky. He's also the author of Deep Undercover, My Secret Life and Tangled Allegiance as a KGB spy in America. Michael Holmes and I got his thoughts on the latest controversy involving Russia and Jared Kushner. If it's true, it's un unbelievably naive. And, you know, the counterpart... The <laughs> This is, look at the juxtaposition between the two players. So supposedly he talked to Kislyak, right? Mm -hmm. Kislyak came to the United States in 1982 as a diplomat with the United Nations. Now, if you, that was the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. if, you, if you had this kind of a job, you were a party member in good standing, you at least reported into the KGB, but you were possibly also KGB. I worked with some of those folks they were, you know, helping me out while I was doing my undercover mm. existence here. So, so there was an incredible mismatch between the two. And it's just a naivete, not only uh, of Mr. Kushner, who, you know, what, what his, his claim to fame is real estate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't really matter who it is in, in American government. There are very, very few people who one-on-one -on -one can hold their own against such a savvy player like Mr. Kislyak. Mm. Yeah, you've said this in interviews that, uh, quote, I'm quoting you, Mr. Barsky, American presidents have historically underestimated the cleverness of, of the Russians. Uh, do tell us what you meant by that. Well, I'm, I'm glad that I'm finally getting to a point where I'm quoted. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Uh, well, uh, historically, uh, uh, um, Stalin play, uh, played Roosevelt in, in the Yalta negotiations. Uh, uh, Kennedy underestimated Khrushchev uh, when they were one-on-one. -on -one. So, so the bottom line here is that the Russians are a whole lot more focused and a whole lot... You know, Americans are nicer, okay? And it isn't just the... Uh, I don't believe it's just the, uh, um, the Soviets. It's, it's uh, the Russian character. We also... Americans don't have a sense of history. If it's 10 years old, it's not worth remembering. Mm -hmm. That's not good. Because if we don't have a foundation in history, we sort of forget the lessons that the previous generation has learned. That Russians are. But aren't how close do you way. think we are to Putin playing Trump, or do you see any parallels? Uh, well, trying to play, but not directly playing him. I don't think so. You know, the, if the two if the two of them are in the same room, uh, it, it is probably a potential that room might explode because of the two big egos. <laughs> I mean, one will not report to the other. But if it's if it, this were a chess game. It's like uh, Mr. Mr. Trump would be playing at least with a rook down. Mm. You know, it's just, just this is not this is a mismatch. Mm. So, so mm. when when you talk about going into a Russian facility and using Russian communications equipment to talk to the Russians as an American, for a start, I, that seems a very naive thing to do if it if it happened. But also, then Mr. Kislyak apparently reporting that approach back to Moscow on channels that he probably knew were being monitored. Yes. Yes. So why, why would he do that? So there's a play within a play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in, in this game, you ultimately really don't know what's real until you get to a point where you have recorded evidence. Everything else is like you, you don't know who you can trust. What would what? be the motivation, though, for Mr. Uh, Kislyak to do that? Just confusion. You know, just, just make, make everything, uh, you know, when you lose your sense of certainty, mm. uh, you know, you don't know what's the truth anymore. It's, it's very difficult to operate in, in, in that kind of a situation. Think about, uh, we don't, at this point, have a, what one might call the Trump doctrine, how to deal with Russia. Mm. 
Well, even if he wanted to, uh, you know, implement one, guilty or not, doesn't matter. There's so much interference right now that he, that even if he wanted to uh, come up with a, a rational policy, it's 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 a rough it's a rough road. Our conversation last hour. Meantime, some in the Baltic states believe that Russia may be setting its sights on a new target. Our Nina Dos Santos traveled to Lithuania to investigate claims that Russia is waging an anti-NATO cyber war. These troops are part of NATO's 4,000 strong increased presence in the Baltics and Poland. They may be here to guard the border, but guarding their reputation is also paramount amid a wave of disinformation designed to sap public support for their presence. In February, German soldiers were falsely accused of raping a girl near their barracks. The allegation made it all the way to Lithuania's parliament and Angela Merkel. For us, it was important that we were able to clarify this together very quickly. From our side, the German side, this was clearly a false report. To combat what they say is a barrage of falsehoods each month, Lithuania has developed its own tools to monitor fake content before it spreads. Receive a um, huge uh, cyber attack in Lithuania. This timeline tracks how events such as NATO exercises trigger information and cyber attacks in real time. From graffiti with anti-NATO messages to doctored footage like this video of an airstrike that never happened and TV polls hacked to give the wrong result, army analysts say they've seen it all. So that poll is wrong because it was hacked? Yes, absolutely. One computer was able to vote 7,500 times and 70% uh, of all votes was like a consequence of cyber attack. Even the Baltic's biggest news agency was compromised. I noticed a strange story in our newswire uh, alleging that uh, American troops were poisoned with mustard gas in Latvia. You know, uh, I immediately turned to our foreign editor and said, you know, what the heck, where is that story come from? And he just you know, shrugged his shoulder and said, I don't know anything about it. And then we realized you know, it looks like a fake news story. Mr. Groblis, thank you. For Lithuania, the culprit is clear and the threat increasing. It's uh, coming from the, our eastern neighbor, from, from Russia. Russia's response to CNN, where's the evidence? It's an ideological war, and uh, on this issue, uh, for us, really, we don't have any doubts. And we have, uh, of course, clear evidences that it's, it's going uh, from Russia. Of course, the advent of fake news and the undermining of NATO aren't just local phenomena. They've been happening right around the world. But here on Europe's most eastern front, in countries like these, so close to Russia, these are risks that are being taken very seriously indeed. Nina Dos Santos, CNN in Vilnius, Lithuania. Donald Trump has condemned the racially charged stabbing on board a train in Portland, Oregon that left two men dead and a third person wounded. The two men killed uh, were a recent college graduate and a military veteran who had intervened after a man allegedly started yelling racial slurs at two women, including one who was wearing a hijab. In a deeply emotional moment, one of the teenagers is thanking the three strangers for coming to her aid. I just want to say thank you to the people who put their life on the line for me because they didn't even know me. And they lost their lives because of me and my friend and the way we looked. And I just want to say thank you to them and their family and that I appreciate them because without them, we probably would be dead right now. And after criticism of no response, the U.S. president did eventually tweet this, quote, the violent attacks in Portland on Friday are unacceptable. The victims were standing up to hate and intolerance. Our prayers are with them. And as you can see, this tweet coming from the official uh, POTUS, at POTUS Twitter account, and not uh, the president's uh, at real Donald Trump, his private account, Twitter account. Up next here on CNN Today, new details about the Manchester bomber in the days leading up to the attack. We're going to have more on the investigation. Stay with us. Come, come, come. I'm Peter Zeitlinger. I'm a cinematographer. To make a perfect shot in Jordan is very easy because the untouched nature is the best artist. 
And in Jordan you find so many beautiful landscapes where millions of colors but all are in the golden tone. Everything is in harmony, vast, grandiose, endless. This is great for pittoresque images. Here you meet people, yeah, make friends, even on the roads. When I describe what I saw today, I would say Dagea, which means great in Arabic. CNN has the man to cut through all of this noise. I'm Wolf Blitzer in Washington. And ask the important questions. I want to bring in our panel to talk a little bit more. Wolf, Tuesday through Saturday on CNN. is flourishing, ever expanding, but it's not just about bigger and taller anymore. See how this city is using new ways to build a smarter, leaner, and greener metropolis of the future. Dubai is incredibly comfortable with thinking big, not being limited by a risk matrix, but looking and seeing what's possible. How is ambition driving innovation in one of the harshest climates on Earth? Global Gateway, Vision in the Desert, a CNN special, Saturday. A sigh of disbelief went up across the land. Another vote, the fourth in three years, but the election June 8th will be vital to determine Britain's Brexit bargaining hand and the European landscape for decades to come. So join me, Christiane Amanpour, for the run-up and all the results. CNN will be your election hub, here at the heart of British politics. Special coverage starts on election day, June 8th, on CNN. I'm Nick Payton Walsh in Kobani, and this is CNN. Welcome everyone to CNN Today. I'm Amara Walker. Time now to get straight to our top stories. Not long ago, a defiant message from North Korean state media. It says leader Kim Jong-un is calling for the ongoing development of the country's ballistic rockets, and that he says the U.S. should be made aware of Pyongyang's power. This comes a day after the North's third ballistic missile test in as many weeks. The death toll in Sri Lanka has climbed to at least 177 after four days of extreme flooding. Mudslides and rising waters have cut off roads, making it harder for emergency crews. Several countries, including India, China and Russia, are now helping with the relief efforts. A week after the terror attack in Manchester, England, people there are struggling to heal. Crowds gathered a couple of hours ago for a vigil in the city center. 22 people died last Monday when a suicide bomber blew himself up outside an Ariana Grande concert. British investigators are working to track down and stop Salman Abedi's network. Police have 15 people in custody for questioning after several raids throughout Manchester. Atika Schubert reports. Well, Manchester police have released a new photo of Salman Abedi. If you take a look at it, he's standing curbside. Uh, it is city center location, and there's a very distinctive blue suitcase next to him. Now, police are looking for anyone that may have seen Abedi uh, with a suitcase at various locations across the city. It's part of an effort to try and retrace his movements uh, in the days before the attack. Now, in addition to that photo, there is also now closed-circuit television footage that has surfaced from a nearby convenience store, also in the city center. And now, in that video, there is a man that appears to be Salman Abedi walking through, uh, picking up uh, food items, and he also appears to be avoiding the camera. You can see his hood up, his hat. Uh, he puts on glasses as well. Uh, now, that footage was aired on BBC. Police say they are looking into the footage. Uh, they're also trying to find any other clues as to what he was doing in the days uh, preceding the attack. They know, for example, that he arrived back in the UK on May 18th and that on the day of the attack, he was also at a short-term rental apartment in the city center, just about a mile and a half away from the arena. And that apartment, police believe, was the staging ground for the attack. Atika Schubert, CNN, Manchester. An American sports writer has been sacked over offensive remarks that he made about the first Asian to win the Indy 500. Japan's Takuma Sato drove to victory Sunday in Indianapolis in what is known as the greatest spectacle in racing. 
His win didn't sit well, though, with Denver Post writer Terry Frey, who tweeted this. Nothing specifically personal, but I am very uncomfortable with a Japanese driver winning the Indianapolis 500 during Memorial Day weekend. Well, that didn't sit well with readers. Many called his comment racist and xenophobic. Frey later apologized to quote anyone offended and Sato. All right, up next here on CNN Today, she moved to the U.S. from Mexico as a teenager and faced abuse as a farmer. Well, now activists are working to protect migrant workers like Alejandrina in this week's Freedom Project. You're watching CNN Today. Indonesia, a culture in transition. Meet the people, trying to keep traditions we need to educate the people, the children, because the party is our culture. While creating a new modern identity. Our mission is to draw global attention to the cuisine. The Keepers, Wednesday on CNN. Another year and another big vote here in the UK. And it's all the talk in places like this. Join me, Max Foster, and CNN for a complete look at the extraordinary and extraordinarily quick vote that will affect lives here in the UK, in Europe, and well beyond. CNN has your UK election story on tap. Special coverage starts on Election Day, June 8th, on CNN. Migrant workers forced to harvest the fields, a practice once commonplace in the United States. Let's talk about reality here. This is farming. Agriculture has been full of opportunities for abuse. What are the grassroots efforts helping eradicate this modern day slavery and better protecting those at the bottom of the supply chain? Fair Food, a CNN Freedom Project series this week. A vibrant country with a wealth of history and culture. And now, cashing in on a wealth of business opportunities. In a CNN special, John Devterios explores how the largest country in the world is positioning itself for global growth. Bold moves, complex relationships. From politics to economics, see what makes this country a major player in our world. Marketplace Russia, Sunday on CNN. Part two of this week's CNN Freedom Project series, we introduce you to a migrant farm worker in the U.S. She once feared going to her daily job, but now sees a brighter future because of what activists did to bring about change. 5.30 a.m. in Immokalee, Florida. It's a dark morning under an overcast sky. As Alejandrina Carrera begins the 40-minute walk to her sister's house to drop off her two small children. It's too early for them to go to school and they're too young to stay home alone. But Alejandrina has a bus to catch. Every day, hundreds of migrant farm workers like Alejandrina come to this parking lot in the center of town where they board old school buses that take them to the fields. Hey! Alejandrina picks tomatoes on a farm about 30 minutes away. She likes her job now, and says she's treated with respect. But it wasn't always that way. Alejandrina came to Amakali from Mexico more than 20 years ago. She was alone, just 14 years old, small, scared, and extremely vulnerable. She says it didn't take long for someone to take advantage of her. It happened at one of the first farms she worked at. She says her boss promised her a better job in a warehouse. But as soon as she got in his truck, he drove to a remote part of the farm and she knew she was in trouble. He told me if we don't do this the easy way, we'll do it the hard way. 
I was afraid and trembling. He tried to abuse me sexually, but he didn't get to because another worker heard me screaming and came to help me. The next day, the boss fired us both. Agricultural workers are without a doubt the most vulnerable workers in the United States and I would say across the world. John S. Forms is co-owner of Sunripe Certified Brands, where Alejandrina works today. Let's talk about reality here. This is farming. This is agriculture. Agriculture has, from the very early days of man farming and needing to have work, has been full of opportunities for abuse. His family-owned farm is one of the largest in the U.S. and was the first to join the Fair Food Program, an innovative initiative that has been held up as the most comprehensive social responsibility program in U.S. agriculture. Today, nearly every farm in Florida has signed on. The program combines a set of high standards that includes monitoring the farms and educating the workers. Buenos dias. Lionel Perez works for the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, or CIW, a nonprofit organization that developed the Fair Food Program. Today, CIW is holding a training session with farm workers, teaching them not only what rights they have, but what to do when those rights are violated. Lionel and the other educators here have first-hand knowledge because they are all former migrant farm workers themselves. The most important thing for me is to be able to talk to other workers because I have a shared experience. I work in the fields too, and now we can work together to end worker abuse. The Fair Food Program works because it has market consequences. If a farm violates the code of conduct, it is suspended from the program and cannot sell to participating buyers, which includes some of the biggest fast food restaurants and grocery stores. It all makes a big difference for those at the bottom of the supply chain, like Alejandrina. You can work freely. You're not going to be harassed. You're not going to be insulted. You're not going to be forced to work. There's more respect now. These days, Alejandrina wakes up in the morning, happy to come to work, proud to talk to her kids about the company she works for. And that, she says, is the biggest change of all. And tomorrow, how some major retailers are joining the fair food program, but one company is refusing to join. Find out why on tomorrow's report. And that's our time, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Amara Walker. World Sport is just ahead.